You make a bunch of noise out here, so they have peace and quiet in here. Because there's no better sound than the squeak-free guarantee from Advantech Subflooring and Advantech Subfloor Adhesive. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Unbuild It podcast. It's Pete Yost hosting with my co-hosts, Steve Basic, architect, Jake Bruden, our builder. <laughs> Hello. I can do both of them. You figure out what you do. Hey, you got my name. So we're talking about claddings, and we've already broken down wall claddings. And it's funny because people say, when you say claddings, what do you mean? And I mean, it's the outside finish on any part of the enclosure. So we have wall claddings and roof claddings. Um, and tonight, today's topic is roof claddings. So we have a whole bunch of different ones we can choose from, and we're going to talk pretty much about all of them. But um, is there anything related to design, Steve, in terms of what affects your roof cladding choices? Um. Like maybe pitch of the roof or style appropriateness, pitch of the roof, budget, venting, unventing, venting, regional decisions. Um, you know, in New England, we do a lot of cedar roofs, so that's pretty common. I think it is interesting that for ad infinitum, we've had asphalt roofing shingles that cost just about a third of almost any other choice. Right, and so asphalt shingles dominate so much, largely because of cost. Although they're pretty versatile, right, and, and easy to install, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, a huge waste disposal problem that we have with uh, asphalt roofing shingles. Um, but uh, the other ones are all almost triple the installed cost. So then, why the heck would anybody pick them? Or more than triple the cost. Yeah, or more, right. Sort well, of the minimum. So the first, I, I guess, myth is that shingles cost more than a metal roof. Really? That There are people that believe shingles cost more than a metal roof? Or not, I mean, oh, metal roof costs more okay. than shingles. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so it depends on how you look at it, right? So if you take your average shingle roof... A metal roof in our region is probably three to four times the cost, mm -hmm. but it lasts three to four times the length. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, but I'm not going to have to pay for the third roof if I put somebody else is. Somebody else is. I'm going to move. Well, so it is more expensive. Quite possibly, if that's the case. But if you're doing your dream house and you're going to live here forever and believe that. Then well, and you'd expect to get the value of that roof back as part of the value transfer yeah. to the new house, right? Because one of the things that goes on the form for the realtor is like, how old is the roof? How old is the boiler? Like, stuff like that. Right. And how, you know, how durable it is. <coughs> maintenance free. Or maintenance friendly, the substance, the material is. So, there, you know, metal roofs have... I mean, for some clients, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, we're doing a metal roof. Why wouldn't we? It's, you know, you don't want the maintenance of the shingle roof. You don't like the look. You like the look of the metal roof. Um, the other thing to consider, believe it or not, is uh, PV arrays mm -hmm. right, on the roof. Um, we have a lot of projects that we do metal roofs just because it's a little easier to attach. And the attachment is external of the cladding and it doesn't penetrate it when you do a metal roof. I think that's a huge deal. Um, and it's interesting when you say metal roofs. I think that you're uh, standing seam, metal standing seam because the, the corrugated roof systems can it's be quite garbage. popular. My brother tells the time with a very experienced carpenter uh, who was installing uh, metal roofing for the first time, the, the corrugated metal. And he goes to put the first fastener in and he puts it in the valley of the corrugation. <laughs> and my brother goes, I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> Note to self. The other consideration, believe it or not, is um, fire control. Mm. Right? I have some projects that are in areas that are prone to get forest <laughs> fires and stuff. And they might not be these blazing fires that, you know, metal roof isn't going to stop that very much. But you know, floating embers and stuff through the air and landing on your roof, 
the metal roof is certainly going to help. I also that. had a client who was moving from a quite aged uh, corrugated metal roof to a standing seam as an upgrade, and that came with an incidental change that the corrugated was a naturally vented roof between the cladding and the rest of the roof, and the standing seam wasn't. And she had, when she made the change, the roofer didn't mention anything <clears throat> about the fact that, hey, by the way, you have a lot more potential. water held in tension and then a lot less drying potential. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when we do our metal roofs, um, I don't know if I ever heard <coughs> this, we always um, apply a, uh, say, about a half inch, um, what is it, uh, back or rod. We tape it to the back of the metal panel. Yeah. So you so you intentionally it, oil can invert the tension. Yeah. Pre camber. Pre camber. The uh, that's the much better than oil canning. So so you've created a bit of a natural vent channel. We create a little bit of a natural vent channel. And an, and you've pre stressed the panel to pre stress the panel in a negative way. So that but it's only, a positive thing. Yeah, but it has to it has to work out of the negative bend before it can even think about going positive. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, same client, uh, the roofing contractor installed a vented ridge vent system for the standing seam with an unvented contact between the rest of the roof and the. Uh, cladding so that when it rained really really hard and it was windy they got a lot of water at the ridge with no place to go but to be held in tension with the uh, roofing underlayment it took me a long time to figure that out but well it actually brings up a, a very common thing that happens you get like it or not roofing is a dirty crappy aspect of our of our industry. Like it is a hard job. It is a hot job. It is one of the jobs that uh, tends to garner unskilled labor and less educated carpenters working in that instance. And I'm saying tends to, I know that there are highly educated, really great people that are, are really paying attention. But what we run into is there's a hailstorm, and then there's a bunch of fly by night that come in from out of town. They, put roofs on, they cut in vents, they don't cut in vents, they add ridge vent instead of the turtle vents, they add turtle vents instead of the ridge vent, they they change the way that the roof yep. can potentially operate. And we've had clients have roofs fail because the ridge vent is more expensive than the turtle vents, and so they put turtle vents on a cathedralized ceiling that was relying on a ridge vent to vent every single joist bay. And now the clients have plywood, plywood even, sheathing, buckling on a roof two years after it was replaced. Do, do you each have a go-to? <clears throat> sounds like, Steve, the go-to cladding for you is standing seam metal. Did you say? Well, that would probably be the number one place for a lot of reasons. I think it's got a nice aesthetic appeal to it <clears throat> in most cases. It, and the PV it's installation. PV yeah. installation. It's highly durable. So I would say that it's... My favorite. 40 colors, 50 colors at least. Yeah, yeah. F colors that last too. Uh, that I would say it's my favorite. Uh, for the most part, it's the first, one of the first things that's ended up getting cut budget wise <laughs> from our jobs. That our market is so dominated by asphalt shingles that people have no problem going, okay, we'll just do shingles. And you know, I, I was working on a couple, I have been working on a couple projects lately where the difference between, oh, that's an inch and a half standing seam compared to an inch, or, oh, that's a 22 gauge, you know, metal roof as opposed to a 26 gauge. And all of these things have an impact on the durability. So while in general, metal standing seam metal roofs are more durable, there's a lot of variability there in terms of the cost of the system. In America, we can take really good things and find a way to make them cheap. <laughs> And Steve, so how low can you take uh, how a stand? Low can you go? Uh, you've taken a rather dry topic and introduced some musical quality, so I, I'm right there with you, buddy. Are you talking about roof slope with metal? I'm roofs? talking about roof slope with metal roofs because I know you have something to say. Uh oh, 112. Right. Oh, I thought oh. you were saying one minute. I was one, gonna say, hold on. I sorry, I put one on. finger up for everybody that's not you're watching. Really the, get your signs down because your signs are. Sorry, how was I supposed to? 
I don't know, but that doesn't work. <laughs> I'm not looking over there. 112? Can't make you really. So, <laughs> can't make you. It's, it's funny that the guy who <clears throat> outsizes all of us says, you can't make me. You know, well, no, I know we can't make you do anything. I know that on the, on the internet, it looks like he's taller than me, that, but he's not. Have Everybody you ever seen keeps that picture of us in the little green box where you look like <laughs> my five year old kid. Where are you going with it this? Does, I don't know. I'm just. It's a long day already. How about that? <laughs> Every picture we took, it looks like it's. Yeah, it looks like my dad's. To school yeah, it looks like my dad's <laughs> taking me for a walk to the, the park. The picture of you and I playing foosball. I mean, I look like a l little, like a, you know, an undersized person as opposed to a full undersized size person. person. <laughs> Is that a politically correct term? <laughs> Undersized person? He's like oh, a person, man. but smaller. Look at his little, <laughs> his little hands. Wow, he's undersized. <laughs> <laughs> undersized person. I don't believe I've ever heard that come out of anybody's mouth before. Is that a term you normally use or was that an accident? <laughs> and then you're driving and you're like, hey, honey, look, there's an undersized person crossing the street. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So we can take a yeah, standing seat. Stop. Along. Put your hand down. I've taken uh, standing seat metal roots down to a 1 in 12, the project Jake and I did. We took it down to 1 in 12 under certain circumstances. And the roofer that I work with says at 1 in 12, he does the double lap in the standing seam, and he always includes uh, like a super high performance. Sealant in that double lap. That's the key. So, you know what's interesting though? It's so the, the lap, I would say, has a lot to do with the wind and mm -hmm. that, not so much drainability or huh. getting like quantity of water, right? So, I don't, I don't know what. How much more of a durable difference the double lap on a one in twelve versus a three in twelve single lap is? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I don't. Mm. I mean, I think they're doing it because they're more worried about how much time the water is spending on the roof. But um, he's he's pretty adamant that that's what they require for or freeze thaw on the roof. Yeah, you're more likely yeah. to have snow sit on a one twelve than you might a a that's twelve true. twelve. Yeah, that would be probably the only reason. In the lower part. But with the 112, what you're saying is we have actually tested we have adequate tested ventilation. And it vented. Yeah, but nicely. That's, a, that's also a 1 in 12, let's call it 1 in 12 with, certain, with special circumstances, right? It's it not was, a 200 by 200 foot roof. Right. It's, it was a pretty narrow roof, 18 feet wide. Yep. And it was, you know, 40 some odd feet long, but it was totally vented on the rakes, the soffit, and the, the, the eaves, the roof eave. So... There and, was a lot that were positive decisions. And dark in color. So, boy, you put BTUs on any roof and the ventilation just screams. It's pretty cool. It starts moving. So what kind of roofs can we install that have very low heat absorption then? Wood. Okay. What else? Mm -hmm. Wood shingle. Uh, probably a white membrane roof. Clay tile. Is clay so, tile that low? Well, I think they I think the density some, would be. They, they take on some heat, but they're pretty well vented. Well, true, but uh, the, can't you grout them too? Though are the grouted ones? No, they're not. Grouted. I've they're never seen them grouted. grouted. Yeah, huh. they're nailed and usually on like a <coughs> metal, on some type of strapping. Skips. Then I'm then I've seen a, a bottom of the clay tile, the the, the leading edge, the very first that's one. mortared, For, like well, an insect and closure, like, uh, alternating too. Yeah, throughout the. Yeah, they're pretty amazing in terms of how much air, how well ventilated they are. Yeah, well, because they're not even on, directly on the roof. They're right. usually set up on top. When we did it um, with Carl Durer, we actually had a plastic corrugated strip that we would set them on. So it was like the rain screen system underneath the Yeah, tile. yeah. So the skip sheathing was yeah. honeycombed. Yes, pretty much. And the, you know, the the... The next or next level to that is a lot of times we do concrete tile too to save like the the real clay tile was a little bit more expensive so you could get the cheapened look with a concrete tile and say not cheapened tile. looked well it, it is a little cheaper of a look okay because you didn't get the barrel vault like the the concrete tiles were typically flat mm -hmm. and thicker 
Um, they had like a one inch face. To that, and the barrel of Walter wounds that are so cool looking. Yeah, they have yeah. that kind of mission yeah. appeal. Yeah. Um, so when we do any of those roof cladding systems, when we have a penetration, we are flashing to the roofing underlayment underneath, not to the to the cladding, of course. Right. Which is a good lesson for homeowners. Quit trying to caulk things down to the shingles. That's not where the problem is. Yeah. The right. system's designed to let the water get underneath that and, layer of shingles. And if that initial amount of caulk or <clears throat> tar it doesn't work, simply add more until you have yeah. a little mount tar on your roof. That seems to be the general approach. You probably charge more for people. You have tar on your roof. Oh, yeah. We've seen well, if, the, if I have to, I, I can't carry the tar up to the roof. I won't do that. It's too heavy. You have subcontractors. I do. Yeah. Um, we talk about tar. Have you uh, have you ever done a, a ballasted roof? A ballasted roof? Like a gravel on top of a... I want to say I have. Where did we do that? It was just once where we did a stone ballasted roof. Where that's like true felt tar. And yeah, and then stone gravel. And I think it was to match an existing hmm. roof system on the house. We, we looked at one like that had a small leak, mm -hmm. and the leak was at a plumbing penetration. And the the and so I actually called a roofing contractor from like two hours away that did ballasted roofs. That was He was probably 75 when he came and looked at it 10 years ago. And he got up and he, fi he brought stuff with him to fix it. Fixed it and then inspected the rest of the roof. And he said, Yeah, this room's probably about from 1950. He said, I, I wouldn't touch it. Seems like it's fine. And I was Ooh. like, What? <laughs> <laughs> this, this roof is 60 years old and you're going, Eh, I wouldn't worry about it. I was like, Okay, sure, we'll leave it. Wow. And he actually drove down here. I bought him lunch and we talked about the stuff that we needed to look at on the roof. And then he didn't bill me. He was like, Ah, oh, no. You know, I get to see him every once in a while. I wouldn't do anything today. I was like, okay. Ooh. You just drove two hours. Like, I tried to get it. sort of the opposite business plan as mine as I get older, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one thing I did want to point out is, with standing seams, kind of a pet peeve of mine, if a penetration like a plumbing stack falls where there's a seam, where there's a standing seam, you know, that's just not flashable. So you got to make sure that you coordinate the spacing with things like penetrations because in a valley. Well, you know, I, 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 you spoke on this before. And yeah. The hard thing that I have to understand is how did you end up, how did somebody end up that way? Because when we do the metal roofs, they usually cut the penetrations in after the roof is on. And they just a cut sealant the to yes, put the flashing they, down? They have a way to flash it or whatever. I just, huh. we were doing a project and I was talking about it and said, and the, the contractor was like, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll cut those in later. I'm not quite sure. How do you cut in later a plumbing stack penetration? Either that or they leave that panel out or something. I, I don't know. They, huh. But it was. Interesting. We, I've never run into an instance where the. Uh, Pause. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. You can pick it back up, but I've never run into an instance. Say that again. No. I've never run into an instance was where you were headed. Start with that. I've never run into an instance where, you know, we I drove onto a project and we had a pipe poking out the seam. So you've never had the like the plumber work with the roofer to get the spacing right. I mean, maybe they do. Yeah. And they figure it out. He wouldn't know. He's in his castle, ticking away on a computer. <laughs> I thought we had had a conversation <laughs> once where player. you talked Let's about play a game of guess who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, IG. Today. I figured I would do a story from the truck since I haven't done one for a while. So we're going to drive to five of my drive sites today and uh, we'll see what's going on. So stay tuned because here we go. Is he trying to be belittling or is he just... I. I thought it was a pretty good routine, but I, clearly he's trying to get under your craw. Okay, so how about this with the flashings mm -hmm. and layout and all that kind of stuff? I've done this twice now, and we're still trying to decide if we really think it's the right way. 
the hilltop house and another house that we built built both don't have roof penetrations. Oh, interesting. They're wall penetrations that then loop yeah. under the soffit and then vent. And so we take a really nice metal roof and we poke holes in it. Really? Yeah. Why don't yeah. we just find a way to not do that? Which brings up, I learned just recently, air admittance valves instead of roof penetrations. You can't use them in Massachusetts. Is that true? Um, I don't believe so. Yeah. Like under islands and stuff, there's special conditions where you can do stuff like yep. that. Huh. But because they're they work they've been around for a long time. They I have several air admittance valves and they work perfectly and they work. fine. Or air admittance vents, I think they're called, yeah. not valves. A couple couple of rules though, when you know when we do talk about roof penetrations, we, you know I try and tell the uh, plumber and such to keep them on the back side of the roof so mm. you drive up, yep. you don't see them. Yeah. And and if we do see them, then you know they're they're really good about you know like shoreline builders. He's he's really good about. He'll put them in an area, but he'll stack like two or three of them together so they look like very intentionally positioned. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, is to put them high on the roof. Or as Why high is as that? You can, it, because they're going to see the least amount of water. Right. There, right. Without being seen. So you don't put them six inches down from the ridge so it's poking up on the backside. But if it's a... 24 foot run they're up in the 20 foot range because you can potentially reduce the water that hits it by two-thirds yeah exactly the old slate roofs the biggest slates were at the eve and if you look at the ridge the, the really tiny slates and of course they have more joints and they would potentially leak more but so little rain falls there they figured well let's put the smallest you know the least expensive and the most available slates at the wait it rains less at the top of my <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so it's kind of neat because when they were doing the new uh, residential college dorms at Yale a couple years ago, even though there's a membrane under that roof and it doesn't matter what kind of slates you use, they followed the same pattern of tiny slates at the top and big slates down at the east. It's east. almost like they didn't have all these membranes and caulkings and things like that. And they had to make things waterproof without going back next week and caulking it a second time. Yeah. Well, you got to remember their buildings were far more forgiving. They were. Than they are today. So sure. So when you're baking that roof dry in the summer, all summer long at 120 degrees. So we we could split these into you know pitched roof claddings and low slope claddings. And so we've talked about asphalt shingles. We've talked about standing seam metal. We talked a little bit about um, corrugated metal, corrugated metal, and um, uh, not slates, but we've talked about uh, cementitious mason clay, clay tile. Clay um, are there any other <coughs> claddings before we move on to low slope wood membranes? Shingle. Wood shingle. I do a lot of uh, cedar wood shingle. Do they still up there? Do they in your market? Do they still install it on skip sheathing? Um, most of the time, we install it on cedar breather. Yeah. They'll put as a, down a self-adhered membrane, like an ice and water shield kind of thing. Or, uh, you know, now you can use zips, self-adhered membrane. And then uh, you put the... Good drying potential behind the cladding, but when you put that membrane down, now you have to have a separate strategy for the sheathing underneath. Right. Yeah. And so um, I've only seen a handful of cedar shake roofs in my market. They were popular in the 80s, and I think all of them are gone now that I was aware of. Is that a 20-year roof? Is it a longer roof for your market? It's a longer roof, and it's, it's like anything. You can buy, um, you know, I, I've seen some houses where they use, like, an Alaskan yellow cedar shingle with damn shingles, you know, 18 inches, and it's like five-eighths of an inch. Yeah, that stuff that was in our market was, like, three-quarter thick, it felt like. Wow. Yeah. So and I was like, well, no wonder it's lasting. Pretty heavy <clears> stuff. <throat> There's only so much you can do, though, right? Like, if it's a product that's affected by UV, yeah. eventually the water and the UV combo are going to be a problem. And like some things, there's there's anomalies. Remember, we so we were we were working on a project where we were taking off a wood shingle, putting on a big addition, and then reshingling the whole house. And I sent you, Peter, your pictures. Remember those cupped shingles? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out why the hell they did that. I mean, they were literally like U shaped. And it wasn't every one. It was like it wasn't the, the was grain like of the wood. Of them. 
I, I don't know. It just, Could have been the way the grain was split. It was really, yeah, but it was really, really weird. I mean, when they cut shingles, there's you don't you don't buy cedar shingles and just throw them on the roof. You get specific roof yeah. shingles that are cut to be on a roof, cut from a certain you know depth and so, dimension. And I think we're seeing a lot less of them because I think they're much more difficult in terms of insurance costs. Yeah, there's a, a certainly a much higher flame issue. And there, there's some some places wood. where there you can't do them anymore because of the yeah, uh, yeah. fire but potential. In England, yeah, yeah. So and that and that probably is driven from insurance only. Like the, well, the code most, still accepts most it. Codes yeah, right. By sure. Right. You have some big catastrophe, and all of a sudden the whole code gets rewritten. So out of everything it's, that we just talked about for slope roofing. Slate is that the most durable? Like my father-in-law's last house was 110 years old or something like that, and had an original roof on we it. We have a project right now with a slate and copper roof. Our house is 120 years old, approximately original slates, and um, I was very concerned that we needed to yank them all off and replace them. Two different roofers come up and say. No, they may look like they're and they're so one mossy. of my, one of my main concerns was the fasteners are not they're straight shank, and so like those are just working up and down, working up and down through the you know the but they're into good solid wood. They're good in solid wood, and he said, "Yeah, so you lose a slate. What do you do? You mm -hmm. go up. Check so they have a uh, they have a program where." Uh, uh, they 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 have a team for this roofing contractor that all they do is uh, random slate replacement. So they come and they have a whole program for it because it's so hard to get a hold of people that know how to do slates. And a lot of times he said, if it's not a major job, we have a crew in, in you know in Vermont because there's so many slate roofs, and we have a business sort of model set up specifically for your problem because some people have missing slates and they'll wait for two years to get them fixed. But he said, we, our response to that was, well, we'll just do it as a, you know, we have a team that goes around, and that's all they do. They're really fast at setting up and doing those replacements. If you wait long enough, they can generate like three or four in the same vicinity. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they replace it. I mean, everything overlaps. Do you have to literally lift one off of a fastener? There are, spe there are special tools for not only, you know, getting the fasteners up and out, but then sliding the next slate in. Yeah. There's, there's just special hand tools that they use for that. It would be pretty neat to see because I have no idea how you fasten the new slate. Well, if you have someone in your life that is uh, currently working on a degree in poetry, at some point they'll know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's the that artisan roofer crew is. But these are all the, guys, you lit, know, lit the, majors. The dead load is it's a heavy yeah, you roof. Have to, you have to make sure that. When you uh, are designing the roof, that the roof structural system, that whatever the roofing material is, that it's giving you knowledge by the structural system. And, you know, the, the joke is that if you have a slate roof uh, in snow country, then if you install gutters, it's an annual installation cost. Because when, when the snow lets go on a slate roof, it just it comes loose all at once. I don't know exactly why that happens, but that's always how they shed. Well, there's even though there's quite a elevation change in them. Sometimes there's not much of a like break that would want to, as things are sliding down, to pop off. It's the same as kind of a metal roof at that point, right? I guess there's so. nothing to. But it's got to be. I mean, all avalanches, I think, are the same concept, right? It's like you have a certain level of friction that's holding. Them. Yeah, holding capacity. And then the weight increases and the friction is starting to get overcome. It's starting to get overcome at some point there's a breaking point where the friction is overcome due to the weight and it goes. There's actually a term for that. It's called self-organized criticality. When you have things mounded up and they're, ran, they're sort of stochastically placed and there's just this point to which it says, ollie ollie and free and it all lets go. It's called self-organized criticality. How many words in that couple paragraphs <laughs> that he said? Did you not know? <laughs> How about Ali Ali Hawkson for the end? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so have we sufficiently brutalized uh, steep slope? We have, buildings? and uh, we're going to have to say flat roofs for another day. We're out of time. We are. We're oh. just under. We don't have time to sufficiently cover it today. I think we Sorry, need to. 
weight and, and run. That's a whole cool topic, yeah, because yeah, we can get into EPA cool roofs. That's a cool cool topic. Garden roofs. Ooh, we have. Oh, uh, we didn't even talk about that beforehand. I thought garden uh, green roofs to get lots of sunlight. On a rooftop, you could potentially get a little bit of uh, roof gardens, roof decks. Okay. All right, living roofs. Push that all into uh, the same category: flat roofs and decks and all that good stuff. Okay, so that's what the Unbuild It podcast calls a cliffhanger. Till next time. Oh, we took it right <laughs> from underneath me. <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. Ask some questions. Like, subscribe, hit the bell so you get the reminder. If you're listening, please go to iTunes and give us a five-star review. That's how other people find out about us. Uh, we're doing this so that other people can find out about us. Uh, we want to share this information, and uh, at least I enjoy doing this. These two might just be along for the ride, but let other people know so that we all get to, to share in this together. Till next time, have a good day. See you on the slopes. <laughs>